Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, welcome to all of you here at um, uh, Central Campus. Also, those of you who are joining us online and uh, those of you who are meeting together at one of our other regional campuses in Airdrie, Bridgeland, South Calgary, and in uh, the Crowfoot Theatres in Northwest Calgary. It is good for me and Gwen to be back uh, with you all after spending some time with pastors of our partner churches in Mexico, um, also uh, taking a little bit of time for rest and relaxation on our way back. Um, Having seen firsthand uh, what God is doing uh, in the Ukraine, and now uh, that was a couple years ago, and now in Mexico, and uh, hearing firsthand reports uh, from our global ministry staff what God's doing uh, in our other partner churches uh, in India, Africa, uh, Nepal, in eastern Canada, Cuba, Moldova, Cambodia, and other regions of the world, I can assure you that the investment that we are making together as a church into our partner churches and our partner agencies is a great uh, investment for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Uh, And my prayer is is that uh, as God blesses us um, uh, together as a church, that we would continue to be a blessing, not only to the over 40 churches that we are now supporting around the world, but that we'd also be able to bless and support an ever-increasing number of churches uh, in the years to come as they reach out to impact their community for Christ. We are hearing of hundreds of people coming to Jesus Christ through our partner churches, and we've got some great men and women who are engaged Um, in the ministry of the gospel all around the world. And uh, your faithfulness, folks, is making a difference um, in in support of them. So God bless you for your prayers. God bless you for the way that you continue to give faithfully of your time right here in our local church, volunteering, uh, wherever it is that you give of your time and of your talents. And God bless you for supporting us financially so that we can continue the, the, the mission that God has called us to locally, but also globally. Okay, we're in a series that uh, we're calling Christianity 101, uh, which focuses on the foundation of our faith, uh, what it is we believe as Christians. And presently, we're examining what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit, in particular, how the Holy Spirit guides us. Now, before we get into it, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and let's just dedicate this time to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for how you reveal yourself so powerfully through your word. And we ask, O God, that you would show us more about not only who the Father is and who the Son is, but but now, Lord, who the Holy Spirit is. Um, Lord, and and how the Holy Spirit uh, wants to um, uh, partner with us, Lord, in fulfilling the mission that you've called us to. I pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would open um, uh, our our hearts to you, that you would focus our minds, and then, Lord, you'd give us the will, the courage to respond in whatever way you'd have us to, for I pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. When I was a boy, my dad bought a new truck, which I really liked. First of all, because it was new. Back then, we didn't buy much of anything new. It was new, and it was bright red. Uh, a short time later, um, you know, hunting season came along, and, and Dad and some of his buddies hopped into our new truck and went hunting. I, I wanted to go along real bad, but Dad said, no, no, son, uh, you're too young. It's just too dangerous for you to go. Uh, well, the day after they went hunting, uh, I was riding in this new truck of ours, and I noticed a hole in the floorboard uh, larger than a toonie. And I turned to Dad and said, Dad, there's, there's a hole in the floor. I mean, I can see the pavement. And, and he says, yeah, he says, I know. He says, uh, one of my buddies forgot to put the safety on his gun, and when he went to reach for it, it went off. And uh, I'm thinking, man, that, that, that wasn't very smart. And I was just a little guy. A few days later, my dad pulled into the driveway, 
And I noticed the mirror on our new truck on the passenger side was all bust up and hanging down. And I said, Dad, what did you hit? And he said, I didn't hit anything. He says, we went hunting again. And one of my friends got a bit anxious, a bit trigger happy, and he shot my beard bits rather than the deer. And I'm thinking, wow, hunting is dangerous. <laughs> I mean, with hunters like this, you know, Bambi can rest easy. <laughs> I mean, it's the truck that's in trouble. Now, at this point, if I was my dad, I, I would have either given up hunting or changed friends. <laughs> but it was not to be. A couple of days later, they jumped into our bruised and battered truck and went hunting again. For obvious reasons, I didn't ask if I could go. <laughs> well, anyways, the next day, I, I found out that they were out all night. They didn't get back until early morning. Turns out they parked the truck in a field somewhere got absorbed tracking some game, didn't watch the time and before they realized that it was getting dark, they spent the better part of the night trying to find the truck. <laughs> uh, anyways, I have visions of the truck going, I'm getting out of here. You know, I'm mean, just... <laughs> anyways, Dad was embarrassed uh, by it all, but I overheard him say to a friend, you know, it was actually quite frightening. We had no light, we had no map, we had no compass, not even a point of reference. We had absolutely no idea where we were, whether we were walking toward the truck or whether we were walking away from it. He said, I've never felt more helpless and to an extent hopeless. Now I share that with you because being hopelessly lost in a wilderness the way that my dad and his friends were, without a map and compass and point of reference, a light, is not unlike facing the future without God. You see, whether you live another five years or you live another 50 years, the rest of your life is uncharted territory. You take God out of the picture and you are moving into your future on your own. You have no point of reference, no guide, you have no clue which way will lead to hope and safety and which way will lead to despair emptiness, and perhaps even destruction. But the good news is this. We don't have to face the future alone. God wants to be our personal guidance counselor through the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 13, just before the Passover celebration, Jesus eats a meal and spends an evening with his disciples. And he speaks to them about a number of areas of concern and events that are about to take place, including the fact that he's about to leave them. He's about to be arrested. He is about to be crucified. He will ascend to be with his father. And, that, and in that conversation, he talks about the fact that he will be leaving, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit of God, would be coming. And that that would be a good thing. Specifically, we read in John 16, verse 7. Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then down in verse 13, Jesus goes on to say, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. When Jesus was on earth and took on physical form, he was limited to be at one place at one time. And one of the reasons he said it is a good thing the Holy Spirit is coming is because the Holy Spirit would now be available to all of you, to all of us. When you sincerely commit your life to Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit enters your life and one of the things he does is he guides you in the way of Jesus Christ. In fact, he wants to guide you the rest of your life. Notice in verse 13 it says, he will guide you into all truth. What an offer from the God of the universe. He is offering us himself. The King of kings and the Lord of lords wants to be your friend and my friend. Amazing. 
But this won't happen unless we open up our lives to him in faith. And we seek to cultivate a close relationship with him. As I said before, the richness of our life hinges on the quality and the depth of our friendship with Jesus. If your relationship with God isn't where it should be, your life will not be what it could be, and particularly not what God wants it to be. He wants us to know him and to trust him, not just to get us to heaven. He wants us to trust him for his wisdom and direction on a daily, moment-by-moment basis. Now, so far in this series of messages on the Holy Spirit, we've seen from the scriptures that in the same way that God spoke to Abraham and Moses and Samuel in the Old Testament, and he spoke to the apostles, James, John, and Peter, and other key church leaders in the New Testament, God continues to speak to us today in a number of ways. There is nothing in the scriptures that indicates that he has stopped speaking to us. And he has been speaking to to God's people down through the centuries. He speaks to us first and foremost through the scriptures, of course. But secondly, through his whispers. And the question that I want to explore in this message is this. So you get a leading. You hear a whisper, a prompting. How do I discern if it is from God? It's a challenging question. And along with my study of the scriptures, my own experience, I have appreciated, I want to give credit to a number of others for being able to tap into their wisdom and their experience and their insights on this particular subject, including Henry and Richard Blackaby, Dr. Jack Deere, Rick Warren, Dallas Willard, and Bill Hybels. So if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn now to Matthew chapter 16. And look down at verse 13, Matthew 16. Now in this passage, we find Jesus and his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, which is about 25 miles due north of the Sea of Galilee. At that time, it was one of the most evil places on the planet, filled with idolatry and the grossest kinds of immorality. Those of you who have been there, you will remember the rusty colored cliffs with cracks in them that the people of that day believed the demons of hell came through. And you will remember a large cave at the base which people in that city believed was the entrance to the underworld, to the gates of hell. And it is at that place where Jesus turns to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? A few disciples venture to guess. But it was Peter who got the right answer. He said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now I want you to notice how Jesus responded in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. On this confession of faith, what was the confession? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. On this confession I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now look at down at verse 21. We're not sure of the timeline, but we believe it's just a short time later. It may have been still at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus begins to talk about another subject. This is what we read. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now notice what happens next. 
Peter took him aside. And he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, never shall this happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, Rick Warren makes an excellent observation here. In these two incidences, Peter makes two statements. In the first instance, when Peter said to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus essentially said, you're right, Peter. You have spoken the truth. I am the Son of God. But Peter, this truth did not come from your own wisdom. This truth was put in your mind by God. Now, go to the second instance. When Jesus spoke about his coming suffering and his death, and people, and Peter rather, rebuked Jesus and said, Lord, this, this will not happen to you. And Jesus essentially said to Peter, Peter, that thought, that didn't come from God. That came from your own human concerns. And it was inspired. It was whispered to you by Satan himself, intended to be a source of distraction and stumbling for me. Two whispers, two thoughts from two different sources. And my point in all of this is some whispers, some leadings come from God. Others come either from our own fleshly desires or from Satan himself. And that's why we read in 1 John 4, 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Well, that's going to be the focus in our time remaining. How do we test a leading or a prompting? How do we know it's from God? Well, to begin with, the first test is this. Does it align with the Scriptures? Whenever you believe you've received a leading or a whisper from the Lord, ask yourself, is this leading consistent with the teaching of the Scriptures? Any leading or prompting that encourages you to violate the clear teaching of the Bible, that calls you to compromise your integrity, to distort or to water down the truth, that is not God's voice because he doesn't contradict himself. God will not whisper to you, it's okay to cheat on your spouse because he or she isn't meeting your sexual needs. Those whispers come from the enemy. Satan will tempt you to justify sin, to water down the truth, to take shortcuts, to look out for number one. He will tempt you to question God's word the same way he did Adam and Eve in the garden. He will whisper in your ear, did God really say this? Are you sure you're interpreting this particular passage correctly? Are you convinced that this is a sin? Now the key to recognizing the lies the deceptions of the enemy is to be in the word of God. To becoming, to becoming familiar with the truth. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This passage says the Bible is God-inspired. It is for teaching us God's truth. It's useful to rebuke and correct us when our attitudes or our values or our behaviors are contrary to the truth and the ways of God. This is why it's so important we know the scriptures and are reading and meditating on them daily. We must not replace investing time in God's word with simply waiting to hear the promptings and the whispers of God. I'm concerned about any movement of people who are closing the Bible and they're just saying, God, speak to me directly. And that's their only source of information from God or hearing God. Very concerned about that. The primary way that we hear from God is through his written word. And I can always tell when a Christ follower is in the word. Because when they talk about hearing from God, most of the time you will hear them say something like, you know, I was reading in the book of Romans this morning. God really encouraged me with this promise. Or God really convicted me about a wrong attitude in my life. You know, I believe to the core of my being that our lives would be so much more joyful and satisfying. Our marriages and our family life and relationships in general would be so much healthier and richer if we just read and reflected more on what God has to say to us in his written word. And we were humble enough not just to read the word or as in this situation, just to hear the word but actually through the power of the Spirit to live out the Word in our lives. Let me give you a little taste of what I mean. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes, those of you whose eyes are still open. Uh. (laughs) All right, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. This isn't permission to go to sleep, okay? But I'm just going to read a few passages of Scripture to you. We're going to have a quiet time together, just for a few moments. Before I read these scriptures, I I want you to open your hands to God like this, and I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, would you speak to me right now through the reading of your word? Would you just speak to me? The way that Samuel did, remember? When he finally figured out it was God that was trying to get through to him, and he just said, Lord, here I am, speak. We're going to do that together. And I just want to say this, you know, when you hear the scripture being read, don't, don't go to thinking, oh, I hope my spouse had just heard that. You know, don't go over to think, oh, my boss is here and he's going to hear that. No, no. Let the Spirit speak to you, all right? All right. From Matthew 6, 24. Then Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? From Ephesians 4.29 Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Philippians 2.3 Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy 
and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So did you hear God speak to you about anything in particular through those readings? Imagine how different our marriages, our family life, our relationships in general would be in a good way if all who call Jesus their Savior, Lord, and King would be in the Word like this on a regular basis would humble themselves, repent, and even just live out the truths of the few passages that I read now and live it out in the power of the Holy Spirit. How transformative that would be in our lives and in our relationships. All that to say this, most of God's will, his direction for our lives is already spelled out for us right here in the scriptures. And that is why we need to be in the scriptures, reading, meditating, studying, applying them to our lives. And so when we hear a whisper from God, when we receive a prompting or a leading from God, we can know it's from God if it aligns with the clear teaching of the word of God. A second test is this. Does the leading or prompting align with the Spirit of Christ? In other words, would Jesus say this? Is this something Jesus would do or would encourage to be done? Dr. Jack Deere, former professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he says, if you observe how Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, or how he spoke to the rich young ruler in in Matthew 19, or how he spoke to his disciples on any number of occasions, the voice of Jesus does not nag, it does not whine. It is calm, quiet, confident. It's not mean or condemning. Now, if that is how he spoke in that day, why would he speak to us any differently today? Why would he scream or shout at us? Why would he make us feel worthless? Make no mistake, the Holy Spirit may convict us of sin. The Holy Spirit may correct us out of love for us and because he wants what's best for us. But if we are left feeling worthless, useless, we can know that the voice that we've heard is not God's voice. Now the Apostle James gives us a framework for discerning whether or not a leading um, reflects the spirit of Christ or whether it reflects the spirit of the enemy. So I'm going to invite you to turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Now in this chapter, James is talking about the power of the tongue. And in verse 14, James says this, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is, notice these words, earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's from the enemy himself. 
So if you receive a word from God, let's say, for someone else, before you share that word with that other person, it is absolutely critical that you allow the Holy Spirit to first examine your own heart to ensure that your motivation for doing this isn't fueled by bitterness or envy or selfish ambition or a desire to get even or to control or to manip manipulate that person. For you see, that is not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the enemy. And if any of those evil motivations are lurking within you toward that person or toward anyone, if they're just in your life, you can know the message that you received to give to that person is not from God and therefore should not be shared. Rather, you need to be spending some time on your knees before God dealing with those issues. Now look down at verse 17. James says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven, in other words, that reflects the spirit of Christ, is first of all pure, then peace-loving, Considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. In other words, a leading or a whisper that comes from the Lord is going to be pure as opposed to filthy. It's going to be peace-loving, meaning it will not be condemning either of yourself or someone else. It will be considerate meaning it will be sensitive and helpful to others rather than be hurtful. It will be full of mercy, meaning it will be gracious and forgiving in nature. It will be submissive, impartial, sincere, and authentic, meaning you won't use it to manipulate other people to get your own way. By making statements like, God told me to tell you this, or God told me to do this. Now, of course, a classic example of this, and it's most appropriate on Valentine's Day, is the guy who approaches a gal who maybe he's gone out with once or something, and he says, God told me that we're to get married. Sometimes our own fleshly desires can cause us to trump God's will with our will. Now, I'm not saying that God never tells someone in advance who they're going to marry. Because I've heard that's happened. But gentlemen, even if you believe you've heard God say you're going to marry a certain woman, please wait until... You actually ask her to marry you, and she says yes. <laughs> then tell her. Not before. Not a good thing. Now, ladies, if some guy tells you God told him the two of you are to be married, consider saying something like this. Well, I'm sure that if you truly did hear from God that we're to be married then God will surely communicate the same thing to me. And when he does, I'll be in touch. <laughs> uh. John Ortberg gives another example of people using the God told me trump card to get their way. He tells the story of a worship leader who came to a worship planning meeting and he laid out the plan for the service. And Ortberg says that he and others in the room quickly realized that this plan wasn't going to work very well, and he proceeded to tell the, 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 the worship leader so. The worship leader kind of um, was quite defensive, and he responded saying, but I prayed about this, and the Lord gave me this worship order. And Ortberg responded, I don't think so. The Lord does much better work than that. My point is we need to be careful about using the God told me to tell you this or the God told me to do this as a trump card to get our own way. That's the point. Notice that James says the wisdom that comes from heaven is submissive. Which means there is a willingness to admit 
And to always say, you know, if you have a word for someone that you believe is from God, you have the humility to say, you know, I believe I've heard this from the Lord, but it is possible I may be mistaken. And so please exercise discernment and seek the Lord's confirmation of this. That's the right spirit. To have a submissive heart means to have a humble heart. To be open to the wisdom of other godly people in our lives, other people on our team. Because generally speaking, God speaks in and through community. He guides us together. It's not about any one person. It is godly, wise men and women seeking God together and speaking into each other's lives. So make no mistake. When people are prideful, when they're unteachable, when they're self-righteous, when they're defensive, when they are judgmental and critical of other people, when they are harsh, when they're accusatory, it's a dead giveaway. They do not reflect the character and the spirit of Christ and therefore whatever it is they say that they believe is from God, we can know that they have not heard from God. A third test is this. Does the leading align with the way that God made you? I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And then down to verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Now, the Holy Spirit's leadings will generally be in line with the way that God made you. For example, if I get a leading from God to pursue a career in professional basketball, I can tell you that I'll know that that leading is not from the Lord. Not only are my fingers short, but I lost a finger on my right hand when I was 12. And I'm telling you, it is tough trying to play basketball at any level with four stubby fingers. The reality is those who make the NBA are not only gifted with major talent for the game, but they are physically wired up for the game as well. I mean, they're like nine feet tall. They have hands so big they can hold the basketball with one hand, like I hold a softball with my little teeny fingers. So it's pretty clear to me that any prompting that I would pursue a professional career in basketball is not from the Lord. Now, in the same way, if, if you're feeling led to sing in a choir, but you're tone deaf, or let's say that maybe you're a prison singer, always behind a few bars and never have the right key. <laughs> you sing in the shower and the dog howls, you know, that kind of thing. That leading is probably not from the Lord. Bill Hybels tells of a man who was so moved by a particular uh, music number during a church service. He was contemplating quitting his job as a successful stockbroker and go full bore into the Christian music industry. He told Hybels, I really feel like that is what God wants me to do. I just can't shake this sense that this is my new calling in life. Hybels paused for a moment and then he asked him some questions. He said, do you have any musical training? And after some hemming and hawing, the fellow said, well, no. What about any experience in singing and songwriting? Was there any time in your youth that you were drawn toward the arts? And again, the answer was no. 
Hmm, said Hybels. Do you sing in the shower at all? A third time, well, no. And he looked at the stockbroker and he said, I'm not trying to burst any God-ordained bubble, but is it possible that at times you're really moved by a powerful song and that maybe God just wants you to reflect on that wonderful experience and just take it all in as a worshipful experience without upending your entire world in order to pursue a new career? Heibel said, I caution people against running headlong into a field that is totally foreign to their wiring patterns, their education, and their experience in life so far. It's not that God can't endorse a dramatic 180-degree turn. It's just that typically when he does that, it gets affirmed in a variety of different ways. And John Ortberg says, the Spirit generally leads people in a direction of your gifts and your talents. And then he goes on to say this, the Spirit generally leads people toward servanthood. In other words, if you get a leading, but if you look at your motivation, it's all about you being noticed. It's all about you um, uh, getting the credit. It's all about you being fulfilled. And it's not about serving and just being faithful to God. You have good reason to question the source of that leading. A fourth test is this. Do godly people that you respect affirm the leading? Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. If you've received a leading that has significant implications for your life and your future, like a marriage proposal, or a career change, or anything else you would consider to be significant. It is always wise to go to a few trusted friends, share with them the prompting that you've received, ask them to join you in prayer on the matter, and give them permission to ask you hard questions, to share any concerns they may have, to be honest with you, plus anything else they sense the Spirit may be speaking into this particular situation. Don't just go to people who agree with you on everything. Go to godly people that you trust and that you know will be honest and objective. If you find that some of these godly people are concerned, are raising questions and red flags, then you need to question it as well. Again, Hybels in his book, The Power of a Whisper, he, he tells of a time in his ministry when he was recuperating from a time of burnout and overcommitment. He was extremely exhausted. He was emotionally fried. And during that time, someone offered him a position to join him in his business. At that time, his church, Willow, was not doing well. Things were falling off the rails. And this particular offer was really appealing to him. He saw many positive things about making the move back into the marketplace. But he, in the midst of just really feeling tempted to do that, he did call some of his trusted godly mentors together and asked for their perspective on this. And they told Bill, they said, Bill, you are no, in no condition emotionally or physically to make this kind of decision right now. And they advised him to not make any decisions for several months. To wait until he was, you know, back healed a little bit at least. And then reevaluate at that time. Months later, when Bill was feeling healthier, he saw things in a different and a better light. And he now realizes that it was the counsel of his godly advisors that prevented him from making what he now sees would have been a wrong decision. God, godly advisors, make sure that you have them in your life. A fifth test is this. Does the leading require you to dishonor 
basic vital commitments. For example, I have a deep commitment to this church. The Spirit will never cause me to dishonor that by prompting me, for example, to not show up on a weekend that I'm scheduled to speak at. As a parent, you have an important commitment to your family. The Spirit will never cause you to dishonor that commitment by leaving them or recklessly putting them in danger. You know, we admire Abraham for his faith. We admire Abraham for getting up and following the Lord to a destination he didn't know. But we forget that he took his family with him. And he took his house with him. It was his tent. He even took his business with him. It was his livestock. You see, even though he didn't know where he was going, he was still able to provide for his family and to keep his basic commitments. If a leading or a whisper from God, uh, if it is from God, it may create some unrest and confusion and even anxiety in you for a time while you're trying to sort it all out and the implications of it all. But in the end, it will always leave you with the peace of God. If anxiety persists, then something isn't right. Either with the decision you made, or you haven't heard God correctly, or perhaps it's your unwillingness to accept or surrender to what God has called you to do. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 says, God is not the God of disorder, but of peace. God may lead me to do things that are going to require great faith. He may call you to go against the grain of our culture. Some of your friends may tell you they think that you're foolish doing what you're thinking God is calling you to do. But generally, his leadings will not call on you to dishonor major commitments or to do outrageous or reckless things. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, do not quench the Spirit. And what that means is don't turn a deaf ear to the Holy Spirit. Don't have selective hearing. Don't shut off the Holy Spirit's voice and His leadings the way you do a radio. Don't fear the Holy Spirit. Don't try to keep the Holy Spirit at a safe, comfortable distance. He is your friend, your counselor, your guide, the source of your strength and power. He has your best interests at heart. He wants to lead you on a priceless faith adventure that will result in a full and satisfying life. And as you keep your eyes on Jesus and you step out on, in faith and you listen to his promptings, he will enrich your faith and transform you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. You will begin to display the very character, the very fruit of the spirit of Jesus in you. The love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. Of Jesus himself I'll close with this a number of years ago I was at Foothills Hospital in the emergency waiting room with a couple waiting for the arrival of their son who had been hurt in an accident and was arriving by air ambulance the waiting area was full of people and during a break in the conversation I scanned the waiting area and was drawn to a woman in her 20s who seemed very distressed over something. Precisely at that moment, I sensed the Lord prompted me to approach her and offer to pray for her. I figured it was just me thinking that. That's often the initial feelings you have. And so I ignored it. I went back to conversing with the couple, but the leading would not go away. In fact, it intensified over time. And with it came the thought, that I was not only to go over and offer to pray for her, but to let her know that 
I'd sense God wanted me to tell her that he loved and cared deeply for her. Now, even though I continued to resist doing this, the leading didn't go away. In fact, it intensified over time. And, and by the way, that's another way of testing whether a leading is from God or not. It just won't go away. It just gets more intense. And so finally, I put aside all my excuses and I asked the couple if I could be excused just for a few moments. And I went over and I introduced myself and I said, you know, you don't know me, but you know, I'm just a follower of Christ and I just sense God wanted me just to come over here and to tell you that he loves you and that he really cares about you and your situation. And I'm just wondering if it would be okay if I just said a short little prayer with you. As soon as I finished saying that, her eyes dropped and she started sobbing. I felt horrible. I was somewhat embarrassed because some of the people around her started glaring at me, you know, wondering, what did you say to her kind of idea. And anyways, after a few moments, she stopped crying and she turned to me and she said, you know, I I'm sorry, I'm... I'm not upset with what you said. I, I'm just a little blown away. Because just minutes before you came over here, I was wondering whether God cared for me at all. I prayed for her, and that was the end of it. I've never seen her since. But I am convinced to the core of my being that she moved a step closer in her faith to God, with God that day. And even if it didn't impact her at all, I can tell you it impacted me big time. My faith in God grew that day. Because I didn't just listen. I stepped out, I risked, and I obeyed. And that's how Jesus wants to grow your faith and my faith. A little step at a time. You know, this is Valentine's weekend, family weekend. And I guess it just leads me to ask the question in closing, do you want to see your relationship with that special someone that you're dating move from ordinary to extraordinary? Do you want to see your marriage go to another whole new level of intimacy and excitement? Do you want to see your family grow closer and your family life grow more exciting and fulfilling? Do you want to see your friendships grow closer and deeper and more meaningful? Then don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit in your life. Don't quench the spirit in your marriage. Don't quench the spirit in your family. Don't quench the spirit among your small group friends. No, open your life to the Spirit. Invite the Spirit to speak to you as you daily read and meditate on the Scriptures. Invite Him to do your day with you and ask Him specifically to direct you, to show you who He is working in, who He might be calling you to serve, to listen to, to have a spiritual conversation with. And then get together with those that you know and love. Your spouse, your family, the person you're dating, your close friends, and share what the Spirit has been saying to you. Share how the Spirit has been leading you and using you to impact the lives of other people. And watch God do a new and exciting thing, not only in you, but in others around you. Oh, may it be so. May it be so. To the glory of God and for the sake of a world that needs the Jesus that we know and love. Would you stand with me for closing prayer? Before I pray, I just want you to pray. <laughs> Again, I'm going to ask you to open your hands like this before God and just take a moment right now and you respond to whatever it is you heard God say to you through his message today you talk with him about it now in your spirit you just do that right now
Heavenly Father, it was out of your great love, the love shared by Father, Son, and Spirit, the community that the Father, Son, and Spirit had. It was out of all of that that you made a decision to create us. You didn't create us because you were bored. You created us because you wanted to have a relationship with us. In the words of Jesus, to be friends. I want to pray, Lord, for anyone here who would describe their Christian life as routine, ritualistic, predictable, and boring. For any marriage, any family that is just going through the motions, families where the highlight of life is limited to figuring out where to vacation next or what toy to buy next. I pray, Lord, that they would see in a new way that you have a priceless adventure of faith marked out for each one of us, an adventure that will transform us, that will transform our marriages and our families, that will change lives around us, that will enrich our friendship with God, with those that we know best, an adventure that will make our faith and our lives anything but boring or predictable and routine. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would be a church, a people who regularly, as individuals, as families, as couples, as small groups, would be saying, here we are, Lord, we're listening. What is it you want to say to us? What is it you want us to do? May we, be, may we just open up our lives to you, O oh God, and experience all that you have for us. For I pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.